from the capital of Raider Nation, Las Vegas, Nevada. It's silver and black today. Your daily dose of all things Las Vegas Raiders football. News, views, guests, and your phone calls are all part of the game plan. There's only one nation, and it listens here. Now your host, Scott Colbranson. Al Davis versus the NFL. The day is finally here, Raider Nation. You get to watch it tonight, 9 o'clock Eastern, ESPN's 3430. Uh, here we are back, silver and black today, hour number two, powered by our good friend Sam and Ash, the injury attorney, 702 702- 820-1234, because you deserve what's right. Joining us now on the Newsmaker line is Ken Rogers, the director of Al Davis versus the NFL on ESPN's 30 for 30. As we mentioned, that's going to be on tonight. Ken is also a senior coordinating producer at NFL Films and the show head at Hard Knocks. Ken, thanks for being with us again. The big day's here, my man. Oh, thank you. I am uh, very excited for tonight. Very excited. All right. Well, let's first talk about kind of the development of this project. How long had this project been sort of sitting in the minds of the folks, including you there at NFL Films, waiting to get done and waiting for the right time to, um, to get it uh, rolling and filmed? I'd say probably a good decade. Uh, certainly after we did uh, Al Davis's Football Life, which was really right after his passing, uh, he was he was immediately given a football life episode upon his passing, given his stature. How could he not be? Um, we, have, we, of course, realized making that episode that there's so many more stories, so many more things we could tell about his life. Uh, and one of them was this battle with Pete Rozelle. But it, it felt like we needed some time to figure out when to do that. You know, what's the right time to do that? Um, and around last summer, when we were doing Hard Knocks with the Raiders, uh, I sort of felt like the time was coming because I, I sensed a, a difference in the relationship between the Raiders and the league office. It, it felt like um, like the animosity was lifting just a little bit uh, between the between the two entities, and I, I think it has a lot to do with uh, the leadership of Mark Davis and, and the fact that he and Roger Goodell and the rest of the owners finally solved the riddle that Al Davis and Pete Rozelle could never solve for four decades, really. In 1980, uh, when the real passionate fighting starts in, that's covered in this film, Al Davis wants to get a world-class stadium. And that's what he and, and Pete Rozell really start fighting about. And that didn't happen until now. And that didn't happen until Allegiant Stadium. And so 2020 felt to me like the end point of this story that this film covers. Yeah, the closure on it is, is really well done. And we'll talk about some of the techniques you used a little bit later. But one of the things that struck me in, in watching the film, Ken, was, you know, this legacy and the really the brilliance when you look at it from a football and, and a branding perspective with the Raiders of Al Davis. It's often misconstrued in my mind, and many view him as sort of like this outlaw villain, right? I, I tend to use the word maverick, but they, they, they paint him as a villain. But in this story with Pete Rozelle, um, that's far from the truth, isn't it? Um, it, it is far from the truth. Um, I, I think Al Davis, um, forget his personality, which was that of, a, of, a, of an outlaw and a rebel, his accomplishments are heroic. I mean, he's, he's, the, he's the man in white when it comes to accomplishments. He, he's the hero. Um, <laughs> Forget the uh, ownership. If you go back before that and everything he did as a commissioner um, and a scout and a head coach would be enough to get him into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But it's really the the strides he made um, off the field that we cover in this film. Um, Just his branding alone of the Raiders and making his mark on the Raiders he changed what sports teams were. It, 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 he developed branding, and a lot of people give Jerry Jones credit, you know, in Dallas. But you know, Jerry learned and came to Al Davis first 
when he wanted to own a team and learned about how to create a brand. And Al Davis developed that. Al Davis uh, developed a type of downfield passing and aggressive defense that we still see today in the 1970s after the 1960s saw the Packers sort of conservative offense and defense and running games with under Vince Lombardi. He revolutionized the game, bringing that AFL style of, of play to the NFL. I mean, on the field, off the field, everywhere you look today, you can see Al Davis uh, and Pete Rozelle. I would say there's no two people that have affected the modern NFL to be where it's at more than those two. Ken Rogers is our guest tonight, director of the new ESPN 30 for 30, Al Davis versus the NFL. Ken, really great job on, on the film. I really enjoyed it. One of the aspects that I found fascinating was, was the te- technology that you used to incorporate both Al Davis and Pete Rozelle into the film. Could you talk to us a little bit about some of those techniques that were used to bring those characters to life? Yeah, listen, I wanted to put uh, <laughs> I wanted to put my career on the line is what I said, <laughs> jokingly. <laughs> Uh, listen, um, we made it very clear um, to the Raiders early on that we wanted this to be Al Davis's story and Pete Rozelle's story. That's it. We didn't want this to be the outsider's viewpoint. We didn't want sports writers or um, people who were witnesses to the story or tangential to the story to be giving their viewpoints on this story. That wasn't fair to Al. It wasn't fair to Pete uh, to to have outsiders tell a story. We had 85% of the film in our archives already of Al and Pete telling their own story. And so when it came to the framing device and bringing it to the modern day and having someone sort of present all of those archives of the past, we kept looking at each other and saying, we just want to hear from Alan Pete. <laughs> we don't want to hear from anyone else. Um, sure, we want to hear from Mark Davis a little bit, and, and we want to hear from people like Brent Musburger and, you know, a, a little flavor from the current day, but really, it's Alan Pete's story. That's who we want to hear from. And in the, you know, 10 years ago, we might have cast actors and and put wigs on them and said, go ahead and act like Al Davis. But with technology today, we were able to use deep fake technology, the sort of thing you see in Star Wars uh, to, to bring Princess Leia back once Carrie Fisher had passed away, or to make Robert De Niro look younger in Irishman with Martin Scorsese's film. Um, so we brought stand-ins into Allegiant Stadium late at night <laughs> in late November and we had men dressed as Al Davis and Pete Rozelle and had them walk around Allegiant Stadium telling their story as Al Davis and Pete Rozelle. And then digitally had the faces, the historical faces, based on footage that we had in our archives, placed on top of their faces, the stand-ins' faces, digitally. Uh, just like you would put a rubber mask on your face, we put digital masks on these men's faces. And in that way, we were able, we were able to, to give Al Davis and Pete Rozelle the ability to tell their own story um, visually. And then audio-wise, we had impressionists do the voices of both Al and Pete and um, combine it all. And what you see in the film feels like Al Davis and Pete Rozelle's spirits coming back to tell their story. Yeah, and, and Ken, I'll tell you, because and, and, we heard as as they've seen some of the videos of your making, and of course you, you've seen some of the deep fake technology, a lot of Raider fans have been kind of nervous about, oh, this is going to be terrible. What if they have the wrong voice? I can tell everybody, since we've seen it already, that you guys did an amazing job with the casting uh, of the voices. They do a great job, and you really do feel like you're listening to Al Davis and Pete Rozelle. Now, for those of us a little longer in the tooth, we remember – some of these events that you catalog in this film, 
Um, and I, I was struck by, again, by the fact that, that since I was younger and wasn't paying as close attention and we didn't have social media and all the digital stuff we have now, is this really was almost like a Shakespearean story. I mean, when you look at all of the things that happened around the trials, when you look at NFL owners having heart attacks right after they're on the stand, you have accusations of a fix on the jury, you have all this different stuff, and you watch this. That's one thing that's remarkable. But then secondarily, um, Ken, and I really want you to talk about this, the toll that it took on both these men, because everybody loves the fighting spirit here at Raider Nation. They love the fighting spirit of Al and what he meant and what he did. But it took, his, it, it took its toll on him, which I think later in life you saw. And then the same with Pete Rosell. I think so. And, and I mean, you say Shakespearean. Um, you know, I'd argue it's it's also like a, a modern day reality show. It's mm. like uh, you know these trials are like the real house owners of uh, the NFL uh, reality show because it's insane what happened in the 1980s, and if it happened today, it would be the highest rated reality show on television. It was, <laughs> it was absolutely crazy, um, and and it, and it was um, enjoyable, I think, to both. Um, the fans watching it then and to people who love reading about that sort of history now and certainly the Raider Nation backing out. But both men paid a, a high price, I think, uh, when it comes to Pete Rozelle. Uh, the price was definitely physical. Uh, he paid a deep physical price, smoking three packs a day, pacing up at night. Um, and I think he lived a shorter life because of not just the lawsuits with the Raiders, but the 1980s were rough for the NFL. You had player strikes, the USFL lawsuits. There, there was a lot going on in the 1980s, and he took his job uh, way, way seriously um, compared to most, and um, and, and it, he definitely paid a toll for it, um, and you can see it in the film. I mean, you can physically see him wearing down. And for Al, um, the success that he had bringing the Raiders to where they were by the end of the 1983 season, you know, you're done 18 Super Bowls, and um, the Raiders had, had won three of them and had a better winning percentage than, than the Steelers, who had won four of them. I mean, the, the Raiders are the gold standard of, of the NFL, maybe of, of the entire sports world. Um, and although they had plenty of good years after that, they also had a lot of down years after 1983. And you have to wonder if, if Al Davis was able to concentrate on football, what he loved, what he um, was best at, the game of football, putting together teams, putting together schemes, coaching staffs, uh, rosters. Um, if he was able to concentrate more on that and less on this never-ending quest to settle the stadium issues, to settle the business issues, to settle the lawsuits, um, what the Raiders could have been. Um, and maybe they would have had more success on the field uh, if this battle wasn't being fought because he paid a lot of dues uh, by, by spending his energy off the field. And again, you have to give a lot of credit to Mark Davis to sort of uh, for ending this, for, for, mm -hmm. for giving, for giving uh, it, it a rest and saying, I'm not going to fight these battles the way my dad did. I'm not going to fight them with bitterness. I'm not going to fight them uh, with acrimony all the time. I'm going to I'm going to get over that, and we're going to move on, and, and we're going to concentrate on on the field issues and get this stadium business over with. And and sure, he's done it. I mean, <laughs> the stadium in this film looks incredible. Yeah, it is. And having been in there a few times uh, this season uh, was amazing. And I'm sitting here at the Raiders headquarters today, and, and you can't but help think of what Al Davis would have thought of this facility as well. And I know, Ken, when you, when you look at this film and when people watch it, I, I thought – the use of the, the, the devices of having the actor stand in and doing the deep fakes on the face, I mean, it really gave me goosebumps because you felt as though uh, you communicated so well in the way you did the film uh, of that sort of um, uh, moving on, that peace, being at peace with, that everybody's kind of finally got what they want. Pete Rozelle, you know, the league did take off and grow, and now it's this big corporate juggernaut. And Al Davis finally did, thanks to his son Mark Davis, get what he wanted, which was uh, what he was focused 
focused on all along was just a stadium, a state of the art stadium and a place to call home. Um, do you feel like finally uh, that, that there's any chance in, in the history of pro sports that we will ever see characters like this again? I don't think so. I think uh, these days um, there's too much uh, there's too much business involved. Mm. You know, these were sportsmen. Uh, they weren't CEOs. You, even Pete Rozelle was a sportsman at heart, and Al Davis was a you know was a was a sportsman more than an owner. Um, these days, the the business is way too big, um, and um, this sort of acrimony is bad for business, and business would probably uh, come first. Um, and there's also the fact that today I think it would probably, this sort of war would be blown up by social media and become much a much bigger deal than it did back then. Mm. Um, and, and the fires would be stoked by by social media and by fans on both sides of the aisle. What's crazy about this film and, and what I think is most touching at the end that you, that you mentioned is despite all these decades of going after one another, uh, the climax of the film to me and the most powerful part is Al Davis describing the moment that Pete Rozelle retires. And he, when he describes it, it's extremely heartfelt. And he describes a physical embrace where they hug. And at one point, the word love is mentioned. And, and you can't believe that these two are talking about each other. But there's a lot of respect for each other. And, and you realize they've been fighting and opponents for years and years and years, but they never lost respect for each other. They never lost admiration for each other as people even though on a business level they disagreed. And I think that would be hard to do today. I think it would quickly devolve into personal animosity uh, instead of just professional disagreement. Yeah, that's well said because I think there. To me, that was one of those lessons. You know, I look at what's been happening uh, in the world of sports, in the in, in the general world, and how people uh, don't often do that. It goes very personal very quickly, uh, and and there and and respect is lost. And so, so the, right. one of the the lessons from your film, I think, is that which has such a wider implication than just in sports. And so, I appreciate that. But Ken, I just got to tell you, man, it was it's a great film. People cannot miss this thing. You did a wonderful job. Your passion uh, in storytelling and the desire to get it right uh, is dead on, and, and I know everybody's going to enjoy it. So thanks for spending so much time with us today. Oh, no problem. I'll tell you, it was a great pleasure to, to spend a, a year uh, inside Raider Nation and, and inside the world of Al Davis, and uh, I think with the new stadium and, uh, and this solution now found, I, I hope that on-field success is soon to follow. All right. That's Ken Rogers, director of Al Davis versus the NFL. You can watch it tonight. ESPN's 30 for 30 debuts at 9 p.m. Eastern time on ESPN. Ken, have a great week. Thanks so much. You too. All right. That's Ken Rogers. Wow. You guys are going to love this thing when you watch it tonight. If you're not excited already, hopefully that conversation with Ken, who's a wonderful filmmaker, uh, will get you excited. Okay. We're going to step aside for a break. When we come back, Evan and I will take your calls. I want to hear your Al Davis moments. 